Hello everyone. Today we are here to study about the special theory of relativity. In 20th century, Albert Einstein changed the way we perceive things in the nature. He came forward with a groundbreaking theory called a special theory of relativity. In this theory, he studied about the objects which moved at constant speed closer to the speed of light. When objects go at such a high speed, they behave something strange, like length contraction and time dilation. So let's buckle up so that we embark in this adventurous journey of special theory of relativity, which itself may reshape the way we understand the universe and its fundamental laws. In our session today, we are going to concentrate on concepts like reference frame or frame of reference, Galilean transformation equations, the velocity addition equation, followed by Maxwell's theory, which brought into Lorentz correction factor and hence the Lorentz transformation equations. So let's start our session with the example. Look at this bogey. Imagine that you are inside this bogey, which is without any windows. If you have a companion with you inside, how would you explain to that person whether you are in rest or in motion? It's difficult, right? On the other hand, when you are in the strain, it's easier to look outside and see whether you are moving or not. So when you look at things outside your frame of reference, for example, if I look outside this train, I see the sign board, the name board of the station as the reference frame or the point of reference. So in a reference frame, I look at a point of reference, for example, let that be a point P, which has coordinates X, Y, Z, at a particular time, which is t is equal to zero. If this point shifts to some other point, giving new, new coordinates at a particular time, which is greater than t is equal to zero, I can tell that I was in motion. So to understand the state of rest or motion, I need to have a reference point or a frame of reference, which is outside my frame of reference, which was the bogey, which or the train that you were in. So there are two frames of reference. The first frame of reference is called as the inertial frame of reference. As the name suggests, inertial frame of reference is that reference frame which moves at uniform velocity. Since it's uniform velocity, its net force and acceleration is zero. And it abides to the Newton's laws of motion while non-inertial frame of reference are the ones which accelerate or rotate and hence the net force is not zero, it is accelerating. So it has force and acceleration and Newton's laws of motion are invalid in this frame of reference. We are going to concentrate only on inertial frames of reference. So let's define an inertial frame of reference. Inertial frame of reference is a set of coordinate axes with a set of clocks synchronized at every point in that space, which is moving at a constant speed and hence called as inertial frame. So every clock in this frame will measure the same time. Let's see what is a point of view. Let's take an example. I have a cart, a person is sitting inside the cart. A ball is thrown from here. The cart is an uniform velocity cart, that is, it is an inertial frame. It moves forward with a constant velocity v. Later, as the ball comes down, it's able to catch at this position. So for the frame of reference of the observer one, who is inside the cart, the ball was simply moving up and coming down. But for the frame of reference of a person who is outside here, 
the second person, the ball was taking a parabolic path. So can you see for the person one and person two, the point of view was different. For the person one, the same ball just moved in a straight line. While for the person two, the point of view gave a parabolic path. So who do you think perceived it correctly? Can we tell that the ball moved in a straight line was correct and the parabolic path was wrong? No. Both were correct according to their frame of reference. Thus came the first law of special theory of relativity, which tells all laws of physics are same in all inertial frames of reference. There is no absolute or correct reference frame. All reference frames are equally valid. So there is no preferred frame where the observation is correct and the other frame where the observation is wrong. Each one will have their point of view. Let's go into the next concept of Galilean transformation. To consider this, let's consider two frames of reference, S and S prime. Initially, I consider that S and S prime are coinciding such that their origins are one over the other at the time t is equal to zero. Later, after a time t, since it's going to move at a constant velocity v, it's going to move forward by a distance vt. If you can see here, the distance covered by the S prime frame of reference that slides over the x-axis and moves forward by a distance vt. So, if I consider an event which is here, now what is an event? Even is, event is some incidence like flash of light that you can observe from both the frames of reference. Event is something that's happening. So we are considering a flash of light. So this event, when measured from both the frames of reference, would have their individual positions as from S frame of reference, it is at a distance X from E, while for S prime, it is at a distance of X prime from E. So if I'm trying to merge the variables X, X prime and VT, can I write x is equal to x prime plus vt. And this equation, which merges the position of stationary frame and the position of moving frame together in one equation, which adds up together, is called as the Galilean transformation. And when we add these things, it is called as the boost. Now, when if I divide the equation throughout by t, that is displacement over time, gives me the next concept, which is velocity. So can I write x over t as velocity u, next term is v, and the next after that is u prime, because x prime over t is the other velocity in the moving frame. So can you see that we have come up with the velocity addition theorem using the concept of Galilean transformations. Now, if I replace the subject and X prime is the subject, I can reframe the Galilean transformation to an inverse Galilean transformation, which is X prime is equal to X minus VT. And t prime is always t because the clocks were synchronized at t is equal to zero. So both the clocks were measuring the same. And we have also found the velocity equation. If u prime is the subject, it is u minus v. So since u is velocity, we have to take care of these signs when we do sums. Anything that moves forward is positive. Anything that moves backwards is negative and based on that you can find the resultant velocity. We could have sums based on this later. Let's now discuss about Maxwell's theory. We very well know 
when a charge, moving charge, is placed in a magnetic field, it experiences a Lorentz force. Now let's make some observation. If I have an observer one who is moving along with the charge Q, then according to the frame of reference of observer one, charge Q is at rest. So charge Q won't exert any force. But for an observer two, who can see the charge moving, it is exerted by some force. So can you see that? The same theory as observed by one and two is different in both the frames of reference. So can we tell that the theory is wrong? Maxwell came forward with his set of explanation. The solution this involves contraction of space. He said, when a moving charge is in its, in its frame of reference, observer one will have a space contracted. And as the space contracted, there would be a changing magnetic field because there is a change in the space between the two charges. Whenever there is a change in the space between the two charges, this induces a magnetic force on the charge Q and hence, even if the observer one sees the charge Q as stationary, he will still see the force exerted. We also know that a change in space, changing in space of the charge will cause a changing electric field. And when a changing electric field is produced, it induces a changing magnetic field. And this changing magnetic field is nothing but the electric and magnetic components, which are mutually perpendicular to each other, giving rise to electromagnetic radiations. Thus, Maxwell explained the concept of electromagnetic waves, which is basically the light waves. He later came forward with four set of equations called as Maxwell's equations. And he also proved that one over square root of two constants, which is permittivity of free space times permeability of free space, gives you a value which is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second. So we can tell that light moves with a constant speed, which is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second, which we all know. But now there is a problem. According to Galilean's theory, velocity of anything that is moving is related. It has to be either more or less than 3 into 10 to the power 8. Is it possible to get the speed of any object more than the speed of light? So there is something which is wrong. Hence, Einstein was faced by two situations. One, Newtonian mechanics is right. Galilean transformation has to be accepted. Second, Maxwell's theory of constancy of the speed of light is correct and modify the Galilean concept or Galilean transformations. And guess what? He came forward with the second option. He modified the Galilean transformation and gave a correction factor and he came up with the second postulate of special theory of relativity, which is called as constancy of the speed of light. Speed of light is going to be constant in a medium, no matter what the light source or the observer is doing. So that's how he came up with two postulates of special theory of relativity. The correction factor that he came up with is with the help of Lorentz, which is called as Lorentz factor or gamma. And Lorentz factor is nothing but one over square root of one minus V square by C square. V is nothing but the speed with which the reference frame moves and C is the speed of light. Now from this equation, we can very well see that V has two options. V, if it is closer to the speed of light, you get gamma as 
infinity, which is 1 over 0. The second option of gamma is 1. So the gamma has two options, either 1 or infinity. From this, we have come up with Lorentz equation in comparison to the Galileo's equation, where 1 over 1 minus v square by c square is gamma or Galilean transformation. The link that you see here are sites that give you good notes on special theory of relativity. You can find the print or a PDF version of this PPT in the description box. So we can see the Galilean transformation was modified into Lorentz transformation, which gave the actual equation that is gamma into delta x minus vt, and inverse of that is the inverse Lorentz transformation, where x is the subject, and x prime is written with respect to x. So in, La, in Galilean transformation, the measurement of length was seen to be same. If you look at this equation, the measurement of length in Galilean transformation was same. While in Lorentz transformation, the length was measured to be different in both the frames of reference. Thus, Einstein, Einstein's theory of relativity came up with the concept that something that was regarded to be same, constant, is no more a constant. Space is no more a constant or it's not an absolute quantity. It is something that's going to be measured differently in both the frames of reference. In the next session, we are going to concentrate more on length contraction, time dilation, and many more such other concepts of special theory of relativity. Kindly like and subscribe my channel so that you can get the latest updates. Thank you.